A very good morning to everyone who's joined in today. Welcome to another exciting session of our research education and training webinar series. We definitely had an overwhelming response for our first session on introduction to research and research methodology. And on behalf of my team, I would like to thank all of those who participated. I would also like to extend our thanks to our facilitators, Mr. Unitin and Ms. Sakel. They're consultants in trauma and orthopedics in our trust, and they've been guiding us throughout this entire journey. Today, lined up, we've got two very talented speakers, Dr. Sangamitra Day and Dr. Rahul Gande, who will give us, in a nutshell, just that we need to know when it comes to systematic review and meta-analysis. So without further delay, um, I'd like to now introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Sangamitra Day. Um, she's currently an F2 in trauma and orthopedics at our trust, which is Ashford and St. Peter's Hospital. She's one of the organizers of this program and has done a number of audits and papers, including a systematic review. And the best part, it's all within just three months of joining the trust. So who better than her to just give us, because she's really experienced it herself, to give us an actual uh, you know, story of her own experience. So please welcome Dr. Sangamitra Day. Hello everyone. Uh, good morning to the ones joining us from within the UK and hello to everybody else. Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes to uh, just share my screen and get started. All right, um, let's begin. Um, so today I'm going to speak about uh, the basic steps of writing a systematic review. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank a few people. Uh, Mr. Kashif Memon, who's put in a lot of invaluable inputs towards making this presentation. Um, Rahul, uh, for literally holding my hand and helping me through um, my first systematic review. Uh, Mr. Anshul Sokti for being uh, the best mentor I could have asked for. And Mr. Ashwin Unitin for facilitating all of this without whom I wouldn't have met any of these people or done any of these things. So without further ado, let's begin. So what is a systematic review? Um, when I started writing my first systematic review, I was introduced uh, to this in a very unique fashion. So I was asked to write a systematic review without any prior knowledge of what a systematic review is. So the first question that comes to mind is, what is a systematic review? Now, as the name suggests, it's a systematic way of reviewing all the published data that is available on a particular topic. So if we were to go through uh, the basic definition of what a systematic review is, it's a type of literature review. So you're reviewing published literature by collecting data you analyze all the data that is uh, published on that particular topic. You critically appraise uh, the research studies that are already there. Uh, critical appraisal, we will get into that shortly. Um, and you synthesize findings in two manners, which is quantitatively and qualitatively. What those things are exactly, we're gonna get into that during this presentation. All right. Now, this is the pyramid of uh, all the kinds of studies and research papers that you can write and publish. And as you can see, the systematic reviews are at the top of that pyramid. This is how I would explain to somebody who has no idea what a systematic review is. A very, very simple way of putting it would be that it's a complete and exhaustive summary of all the current literature that is published or present uh, on your particular research topic or question. So it's a, basically, it's a very, very detailed summary of everything that is published on that topic. 
So how do you start working on one? The initial steps before you start doing anything is that you decide what you're going to write, what topic is it going to be. Uh, you scope the literature that is present or published on that topic. You plan. Planning is very important. You have to form a team. You cannot write a systematic review by yourself. Uh, you must have a team of members where you're going to delegate jobs. Uh, there are going to be people uh, responsible for finding data, so searching on the database. Uh, then there, there are going to be people who should be responsible for collecting or extracting data from those papers. Um, people who will then start writing the paper, writing the abstract and starting to write the, the methods and the discussion and all of that. And of course, at the end, you also need people who are going to be reviewing what you have written and discuss and have, you know, a bouncing board between people so that you know that what you're writing and what you're doing is getting you somewhere. The next steps would be to formulate a question. So formulating the question, this was actually discussed in the first webinar, which is the, the PICO model, which is most commonly used. Um, you need to have a clear question in your mind. What are you asking? Now the PICO model helps you with that. This is a very basic example to explain what the PICO model is. So the P, which is for population here, in this example is very specific. It's middle-aged men suffering from phantom limb pain. What is your intervention? It's gabapentin. What are you comparing that to? You're comparing it with placebo. And what is your outcome? You're seeing if it's effective in decreasing the pain symptoms. So it's a very specific question that you're asking. After you formulated your question, then you do your data search. Now for data search, um, for those of you who have not watched the first session, I would highly recommend that you do. It's there on YouTube um, where Mr. Sopti explained how to use mesh terms and how to carry out data search. Um, and once you have your formulated question, uh, you know what mesh terms to use, what to include what to exclude in your search criteria and then once you've found those papers based on your search um, then you extract the data so this is using mesh terms you you search on pubmed and you find your papers after you found your papers you do your data extraction so for, for example this is a table from a systematic review that has been published uh, the topic of this systematic review is comparing laparoscopic surgery to open surgery. Now here you can see how they've extracted certain data. So they've got the names of the authors, when it was published, what the title of those papers are, what type of studies they are. So these are mostly randomized control trials. Now um, it's a fact that when you do a systematic review, if you're using randomized control trials, it actually comes at the top of the category that you can write. You can, it's, it's kind of the best kind of systematic review that you can write if you're including randomized control trials. And also here, they've, incl they've mentioned what their inclusion criteria was. So this would be determined by what your PICO model was in the first place. So after that, you would critically appraise the papers that you have now narrowed down to based on your data search and based on your um, inclusion and exclusion criteria. Now that you have the papers that you do have, you will critically appraise those papers. Now, why that is important is that what is critical appraisal? You're checking if the quality of the papers that you're going to include in your systematic review um, is good because you wouldn't want 
the quality of your systematic review to be affected uh, by, let's say, including a particular number of research papers that were perhaps not carried out well or have a lot of lacunae. So the, so the numbers or the data or their conclusion might be off. And you wouldn't want um, that to affect your conclusion that you're going to make in your systematic review. So critically appraising the papers is very important. There are tools that you can use to do that, uh, which we will uh, look into uh, very, very briefly. Um, and after you have critically appraised your papers, then that will narrow down the number of papers to even lesser than what you had initially found. From those papers now, what you will do next is that you will synthesize data. Now, what is data synthesis? It's doing all the tables and graphs and extracting all the numbers, making pie charts and statistics and making forest plots and all of that, which will be discussed in detail by Rahul in this session. And also the next session is completely dedicated to um, discussing st statistics. So they will go into more depth uh, in that. Now, after you've done all of that, what you are left to do is that you interpret those findings and the results. Now, this is a tool. This is an example of a tool that, that can be used to critically appraise a paper. It's called the CASP. Um, so I'm not going to read through what it is. You can find it on the internet. It's basically just a questionnaire um, and you, you have to just fill out a yes or a no. And based on that, you score a paper and you know whether uh, the quality of that paper is good or not. Now, after you've done all of that, now you start writing. Okay. Now, when you start writing, the best way to go about it is to use the Prisma checklist so that you do not miss out anything so that you have included everything exactly the way a systematic review is to be written. This is the Prisma checklist. So as you can see, you can literally use this as a checklist so you can mark whether you have included all these things or not in your paper. And that way you will assure the quality of your own paper. So of course, the first thing would be to come up with an appropriate title. You need to be very clear as to whether what you're writing is a systematic review or is it a meta-analysis or is it both? What is the difference? Rahul will tell you. Okay, then, then comes the abstract. Now, what is an abstract? Now, I know in, in the beginning I said that a systematic review is kind of an exhaustive summary of all the data that has been published on a particular topic. But the abstract for the systematic review is kind of the summary of that summary. So in, in a very short summarized fashion in the beginning of the paper, so that even without reading and going through the entire paper, when you read the abstract, you know exactly what this paper is talking about. So that is the whole idea behind writing an abstract. And your abstract needs to be on point so that it actually, uh, you know, grabs the reader's attention and the reader's like, yes, I want to read this paper. Then you give your introduction. Uh, you, you mention what your PICO model, uh, what, what, what the criteria was, what is the reason behind you deciding to write a systematic review on this topic. And then, so let me give you an example. The paper that we're discussing here uh, laparoscopic versus open surgery. You can see the abstract here. Okay, so in the abstract, you see the background. So what is the background? You, you're summarizing all the Cochrane systematic reviews that compare the use of laparoscopic versus open. Okay, so that's your background. What is here? You also give a short uh, 
description of your methods. So where did you find that data? Uh, what the timeline of that data was? What was used to analyze or to critically appraise? Here, Amster, this is also a critical, uh, critically uh, appraising uh, tool. Um, you give a short summary of your results. So you give them in a very, very short manner what the result of your systematic review is and what the conclusion is. So here the conclusion is that laparoscopic has an advantage over open surgery. Okay, now doing the methods. Here, when you look at the steps of writing your methods, it might look overwhelming because a lot of things need to be mentioned and discussed and and basically documented um, you need to know not not just you need to know but the readers and wherever it's going to get published they need to know where you found your data um, whether it's officially published um, whether it's a legal study um, what the PICO model was, um, what your strategy was, what mesh terms did you use while trying to search for this data, um, all of that. Now, I'm going to show you what you can use. So, for example, this in this paper, you have a very clear inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, their inclusion criteria was that the papers that they're going to use for this systematic review should have been published on the Cochrane database. That's their first inclusion criteria. And the second inclusion criteria was that it needs to clearly compare laparoscopic versus open. And their exclusion criteria was to exclude any paper that talks about robotic assisted procedures. So, this also needs to be mentioned in your method section because that is how you're going to explain how out of the papers that you have found, why you decided to include some and why you decided to exclude some. Because otherwise at the end, you might get into trouble for not including certain papers um, because the reason would not be clear. People might say that you've not included a paper because it does not support your conclusion so you need to be you need to basically cover for yourself when you're writing a paper and say this is why i included this paper this is why i excluded this paper this is a prisma flow diagram uh, that you can use uh, while writing your methods so all you need to do is fill in your numbers so how many records did you identify in your database search Additional records, maybe you found some in, uh, you know, hard copy journals or from, from your library. And then how many were duplicates? How many did you remove from that? How many did you screen? So screening is basically maybe you've just gone through the abstract and you've decided, no, this is not for me, not for this paper. Or this paper seems like it, uh, you know, fills in the criteria that I have for writing this paper. And after you've included and excluded, after reading, just screening through uh, the abstracts, that's when you would go in to read the full text articles. Um, and then after you've read the full text articles, how many did you include? How many did you exclude? And with reasons. So why did you exclude them, which we just discussed uh, in the previous slide? And then how many did you include in the qualitative synthesis and in the quantitative synthesis? So in this uh, paper, uh, the systematic review about the open surgery versus laparoscopic surgery, this is how they have done it. So you can see how they initially found 588 records from their initial search, but they excluded 538 that did not meet their inclusion criteria. So they included only 50 and then they had an update which gave them one more article and this is how they have divided uh, their data. Then would be your results. So all your numbers and 
your your graphs and your tables and all the analysis of 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 your numbers and statistically analyzing and giving out conclusions in terms of either qualitatively or quantitatively you discuss your results you fill in all these criteria you make sure as a checklist you just go through this and make sure that you've um, added all of this in your results so this would be an example of a qualitative uh, data table where you're not really discussing any numbers but you're just discussing okay this is the author this was the paper and what it favored so some of them have clearly favored laparoscopic surgery many of them have not clearly favored one over the other and you can see just one that favored open surgery so this is a qualitative data uh, table now this is a quantitative results table where you're discussing exact numbers of uh, all these criteria that you have mortality infection reoperation length of stay morbidity um, and you see statistically with solid numbers to back up your um, your whatever your the point that you're trying to make is all here statistically backed up all right now one thing that can make or break your paper which is extremely crucial is your discussion your discussion needs to be extensively detailed it needs to discuss everything starting from why you decided to write this paper what the uh, intention behind writing this paper is um, what you have found in all the papers that you have included uh, and it needs to be a very unbiased neutral way of just looking at what the data is if you have a pre uh, you know an already preconceived notion as to what you want your conclusion to be that will affect your paper you need to neutrally just look at the data and see what each of those papers are saying now what we need to understand is that the whole point of writing a systematic review is to tell someone to tell the entire community of doctors or researchers that okay on this topic this is what the published research is this is what we have found based on all of those papers and then you can see what the limitations of those studies are which would then encourage further research to maybe answer those unanswered questions or uh, um, come up with ways in which you can fix all the lacunae that have been there in in these previously published papers so you can see how in a discussion you need to explain why the uh, this topic was undertaken what the effects were what you have compared for example here this is a this is something that you're you're making a statement where you're saying how some authors have avoided making statements that would explicitly support or refute uh laparoscopic versus open um and so when you make a recommendation at the end you would hear for example in summary um they've asked that people should uh, evaluate the benefits of laparoscopic procedure by procedure um, because what they have found in this paper is that they have just in general compared laparoscopic versus open surgery um, what they are recommending is that it needs to be a, on a particular procedure so for example as a very basic example 
example, if you're talking about appendectomies, you need to only talk about how in appendectomy, whether laparoscopic had more advantage over open surgery. Um, and not just procedure by procedure, but they've also mentioned how they, they noted inconsistencies involving the precise definition of the population inclusion and exclusion criteria in certain papers. So what this would do is it would encourage further studies uh, with better inclusion and exclusion criteria with a better PICO model where you would then compare procedure by procedure, which would then give, give you better results and a better understanding of that comparison. Also, like here in the limitations, they have said how um, there was a wide variability in the study populations. So perhaps the, the, the population in, in your PICO model was not very specific. It was very wide and you cannot compare, um, let's say a five-year-old child with an 87-year-old man uh, and compare their outcomes of a laparoscopic versus open because of course there are going to be many other factors that are going to affect that conclusion. Um, and of course there was uh, heterogeneity found as well. Now what is heterogeneity will also be discussed by Rahul because that comes under uh, meta-analysis. Um, yeah, also you need to make your references uh, tables about what the papers that you've included. There are many softwares that you can use to do your references. Um, all right, so the final steps before you decide to publish would be to revise what you have written. You might think that you've written an on point systematic review and everything is so good and you're very proud of your end product, but before your very precious end product goes out into the world, you need to make sure that you have got it reviewed by your seniors, by more experienced uh, people. Uh, you need to make sure that your grammar is on point. Also, you need to do a plagiarism check because if they find even more than a couple of sentences that have been repeated in previous studies or basically if you even you're not even making a new uh, point, you know, what you're saying has already been said, then that would come under that as well. So you need to make sure that your plagiarism check is done. And then the final step would be to submit to a journal. All right, so that is how you do a systematic review in a very, very basic uh, fashion. Um, that is the end of my presentation. And now um, I would hand it over to Anjali to introduce Rahul. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Day. That was absolutely brilliant. I'm sure uh, it's made the whole concept of systematic reviews very easy to comprehend for all of us. And uh, I definitely have a lot of inhibitions when it comes to even thinking of doing a systematic review. So I'm sure I've got lesser inhibitions now thanks to this amazing presentation. Our next speaker uh, lined up today is Dr. Gade. Uh, he has done his general surgery training in Miami, Florida, USA, and he's currently working as an SHO in trauma and orthopedics at our trust, which is Ashford and St. Peter's Hospital. He has published eight meta-analyses and has a background in basic science research, metabolomic pro uh, profiling in cancer cells, and has a special interest in retroperitoneal cancers especially the gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So I'm sure he's going to take us through an amazing journey of just after we finish systematic review, we're going into the branch of meta-analysis and I'm sure you, all our doubts are gonna be cleared. So please welcome Dr. Gadi. If you can just please share your screen. Yeah, thank you Anjali for that uh, kind introduction. <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna be talking about meta-analysis. Uh, I'm going to share the screen in one second. Can you guys see my, uh, yes, okay. So before we dive into uh, meta-analysis, uh, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, and uh, you know, all your 
participation has given us a, a drive to conduct these uh, webinars on a, a regular basis um, to educate everyone uh, as much as we can about uh, research and research methodology. Now, we're going to talk about meta-analysis um, and what it takes to do a meta-analysis. Uh, mind you, this, this is a basic overview. Uh, we can spend two, three hours talking about how to do a meta-analysis. So to, as we go through the journey of the, the research webinars, you'll get more understanding about how to do the statistics behind uh, the meta-analysis or, you know, uh, whether it's a, or a retrospective or a randomized control trial um, of that sort. Now, the first thing is meta-analysis was first uh, the term or the, the, the meta-analysis itself was started uh, by Glass in 1976. And a meta-analysis uh, in definition is a statistical technique that combines the results of independent and the keyword being similar studies so that you can obtain a overall estimate of treatment effect or um, risk. Um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be about a specific treatment. It could be about, you know, whether someone is at risk for something else as well. Now, now meta-analysis are based on systematic review because systematic reviews are a qualitative analysis uh, of, the, of the literature, but all systematic reviews cannot be cannot become meta-analysis. What I mean by that is you can do a systematic review, which is a qualitative analysis of the papers um, that are being published. But if there is no true comparison to be found, it's very hard to do a meta-analysis because meta-analysis is premeditated on the fact that you need to have, you have to compare like to like. So you're taking like to like published papers and you're pulling them together to be able to do a statistical analysis and give you an overall estimate of the effect that's being uh, discussed within your research question. If a meta-analysis is to be included in a systematic review, it's very it's good habit to either consult a, a experienced statistician or an epidemiologist so that they can provide guidance in terms of what uh, you know statistics can be used uh, in these meta-analyses. Now when I say experienced statisticians, what do they provide? You know, whether or not you want to use relative risk, odds risk, odds ratio, you know, uh, whether or not you need to do a meta regression, et cetera. And we'll come to most of these things as we go through the, the next few slides. When doing a meta analysis, there are different protocols. Um, and my colleague, Dr. Day had mentioned about the Prisma checklist. Uh, when you're doing meta analysis, uh, there are studies that are randomized controlled trials which use a, a quorum uh, format, or if you're doing a, a qualitative, um, you know, critical appraisal of studies, then you can use the STROBE checklist, which is STROBE stands for strengthening uh, of the reporting of observational studies. Now, the purpose of these guidelines is to provide proper procedure for conducting a meta-analysis and to standardize methods for reporting a meta-analysis and also to give the <clears throat> readers a qualitative assessment of the included papers uh, because there are certain papers that will not report on all the findings that they've had, um, which again, we'll talk about later on and, and that, you know, that goes into publication bias and or other inherent biases that exist in research. Now, what are the steps of, uh, of a meta-analysis? So you, can, you have to, again, define the research question you have to perform your literature search. You select your studies, extract, analyze, and then report. So obviously, we've already you know, talked about the reporting and on how to write a paper, as Dr. Dave mentioned earlier. Now, coming to the research question. So the common questions that are addressed in meta-analysis are whether one treatment is more effective than another, or if exposure to a certain agent can result in a disease. So when you're comparing treatment, you can compare either, you know, whether aspirin or clopidogrel um, is better in a TIA. Um, or when you're assessing for an exposure to a, a certain agent, you know, even though we all know that smoking causes lung cancer, uh, hypothetically, if we were to say that smoking doesn't, you know, there was no association there, but then there's 10 studies talking about it, um, you can pull the results to say, okay, the smokers, non-smokers, what is the risk 
risk uh, do they, who develops lung cancer um, at a, or who's at a higher risk of developing lung cancer. Now, when performing the literature search, uh, this is the critical step in the meta-analysis and the most difficult part. The reason it is the critical step and the most difficult part is when you do a search, you need to be able to find all relevant studies so that they can be pooled and give you a true estimate of the effect that you were looking into. Now, the research should, uh, the, the person who's doing the meta-analysis should search more than just one database to be able to do a comprehensive search. With any research, reproducibility is a hallmark of why we're doing research. So if I were to do the same search that you've done sitting here, I should be able to come up with the same set of papers or same set of uh, steps uh, you know, to have say that you found 20 papers on smoking and lung cancer. I should be able to reproduce that same search to, and, and get the same 20 papers that you're talking about. Now, if you just stick to one particular database, not all of them, all of the papers will be indexed in one particular database. Therefore, you need to be able to, the, the, the three or four important databases to search where, you know, if not all, 99.9% .9 of, of the papers will be indexed would be your Medline or PubMed, Embase, Sinhal, and the most important one for the meta-analysis being the Cochrane Central Register of Controlled Trials. Um, these could be unpublished clinical trials or published clinical trials. And also, before I forget, one of the most important parts of doing a meta-analysis is when you're doing the search, you might already find that a meta-analysis on a particular top on the topic that in question was already done. That does not mean that you cannot do another update of that meta-analysis. But the most important part here is you have to increase your sample size. So after a published meta-analysis, there's three, four more papers with a good sample size then maybe if the first meta-analysis was unequivocal in terms of showing an, a, an estimate of effect, then you can include these new papers to increase your sample size, and therefore may, you may or may not show, again, of whether there's an estimate that of effect was found or was not found. So when you're se selecting your studies, before you start the meta-analysis, while you, when you've populated your PI PICO model, you need to be able to predefine your inclusion and exclusion criteria. So what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria that we're talking about here? So factors that determine these are, you know, you, the study design. Do you want to only do a meta-analysis on randomized control trials, or are you going to pull randomized control trials and observational studies together? So for most meta-analysis, you're going to, uh, you know, try to stop at the observational part. Not that you can't do it for uh, case control. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't do it for uh, just a case report, um, you know, or cross-sectional. You can, but the evidence that you will find uh, may not be the true estimate of effect. And while you're doing the uh, uh, inclusion criteria, you know, what are the population characteristics? What type of treatment or exposure are you looking for? And what are the outcome measures? Now, for example, if you're doing a meta-analysis, say on, you know, gastric cancer, and you wanted to see whether, you know, palliative gastrectomy or palliative gastrectomy with metastatic resection of liver meds, what, which one would give you increased survival? That, you know, you, your outcome measures would be one, three, and five-year, you know, survival. You can say that, you know, I'm going to only look at one and three-year survival. So you can't, while you're extracting the data, you can't uh, then begin to change your outcome measures. So predefined outcome measures will make you stick to a predefined plan. Deviation from the plan is okay, given that when you write the protocol that these things are uh, discussed, that if there is more data available, then I would like to include these type of factors. Now, a meta-analysis, like I said, needs to be documented. As my colleague explained before, extraction of the data is a very big job and probably one of the key steps in a meta-analysis. So the best 
way to keep track of the studies that are being included and excluded is obviously you can use your the PRISMA uh, diagram that Dr. Day had mentioned earlier. Also, you should be able to create an Excel sheet with extraction of all the data. What this does is this gives you uh, the ability to go back and see if there's any errors made during your data extraction. Um, the data extraction can be checked by another reviewer so that you know, there's no wrong reporting of the uh, outcomes. So the quorum guidelines are for, again, randomized control trials of, uh, uh, in terms of reporting a meta-analysis. And the, the quorum guidelines or the PRISMA guidelines, either or, the diagrams are pretty similar in terms of how you would uh, structure your search and then you know, have that flow chart of saying, I've included these studies, I've excluded these studies, and why have I ex excluded those certain studies? Now, what is the validity of a meta-analysis and what does that depend on? The validity of a meta-analysis, again, depends on the included studies, the quality, and you know, basically those two things. Now, the studies included, again, obviously if you're doing a meta-analysis of randomized control trials, that gives you a stronger footing rather than observational studies. Now, the quality assessment plays a role if the quality of the observational studies included were better than the randomized control trials. So you can use the strobe checklist for the observational studies and uh, a different checklist for the randomized control trials to say, okay, this is a qualitatively, this, this paper mentioned, uh, you know, the study design, this was what they mentioned, how long were they following, the follow-up was, they've mentioned all of the patient characteristics, there's clear evidence, you know, there's a, the stroke guidelines is about a 22 step checklist that you can go through to kind of give each paper a qualitative score or a quantitative score based on the quali qualitative analysis of the paper. Now, extracting the data, what type of data should you extract and, you know, and how is that important? The type of data you can extract can be determined in the design phase <clears throat> and a standardized form is constructed. This is when I'm talking about using a, uh, a Excel sheet to say, you know, I'm going to put on the uh, columns the, the names of the studies. Next to that, I'm going to put the uh, design of the study, the number of, uh, you know, in intervention group, number for the control group, um, what are the what is the age in the next column of the average age for the intervention, you know, uh, or average age for the control? Same goes on on and on with the rest of them. So some commonly used uh, examples on what to extract are study design, descriptions, diagnostic information, whether how many people underwent palliative gastrectomy, uh, of that how many people had chemotherapy, or of that how many people had chemotherapy. Uh, only and no palliative gastrectomy for gastric cancers. It was the, the, the important part being, you know, what was the length of the follow-up evaluation? Because long-term follow-up gives you a better validity for the study. And what are the outcome measures that you're interested in extracting? So the difficulty, as I said before, with data extraction is studies, again, use different outcome metrics, uh, which may combining the data awkward. So you should try to keep all outcome metrics the same across studies. So if, you know, for example, if one study told, uh, gave you a uh, result saying there was 20 males uh, or, you know, the, and, and uh, uh, 10 females and the other study, you know, didn't really talk about it, then, you know, that study, that study needs not necessarily be excluded from the meta-analysis, but in terms of comparison of those, uh, whether, you know, male or female had any effect on your outcome measures. Now, how do you do the, how do you analyze the data in a meta-analysis? So there are two statistical methods that are commonly used. Um, there's numerous softwares that exist. Uh, the more, most common one that people tend to use is RevMan, which is uh, developed by the Cochrane uh, people. And uh, there's other ones like Stata, SPSS, R, um, that you can use or SAS that you can use to conduct these meta-analyses. The two models in question are the fixed effects and the random effects model. 
A fixed effects model is also known as the mantle hansel method. A random effects model is known as the Gersimonian Laird method. Now, what is the fundamental difference between using a fixed effects or a random effects model? The fixed effects model assumes that the true effect of treatment is the same for every study, meaning there is no interstudy variance. Now, and then the random effects model assumes that the true effect estimate varies between each studies. So from a, a logical point of view, it's good to always use the random effects model because you're accounting for any bias that is inherent within a, within a study. Usually what happens is you do a fixed effect model and then depending on the clinical or statistical heterogeneity, you test the random effects model. We'll talk about what the statistical heterogeneity, how do you look at the statistical heterogeneity depending on the result, uh, output of results. Now, this is an example of the forest plot that you'll get once you've uh, input all the numbers and have done your run the command to get the so-called forest plot. In this forest plot, obviously, you know, the basically you can see here is the studies. This, you know, particular forest plot talks about the odds ratio. Here is your weight, and this is the log 10 scale um, that's being used. And here uh, you, you should, sorry, here as you can see, you know, in terms of what, what do these terms mean? So usually you have your favors the inter, uh, intervention, favors the control, um, you know, what is it that you're looking for? And also the weight is based on the size of the box here. So this is your 95% confidence interval. And depending on this, your, the size of this box, the, the, each study gets a weight. So based on, uh, say, the sample size and, uh, and other things, you, you're going to get the, the weightage for each study. Now this, again, as you can see, this is the weighted mean difference because we're talking about the mean here. And if, depending on where this, the, the most important part of, of the meta-analysis is the overall effect, and as you can see, if this is to cross the line of no effect, then there is, uh, you can't really say that you found uh, actual difference of whether it favors the intervention or favors the control. Now, I was mentioning, when do you do a random effects model or a fixed effects model? This is called the heterogeneity or how much, uh, how comparable are the studies? You know, and this is based on obviously this line, you know, when you have a lineup of studies here, when you have five studies on this side, uh, two, that, two or three that cross here, and then four on this side, you will have a higher heterogeneity. And based on how high the heterogeneity is, then you, can, you have a predefined p-value, which tells you even though the I squared is high, there's no, the p-value doesn't really show that you know, it's statistically significant. So however, it's good practice to say that if you, your I squared is more than 50%, you should essentially run a random effects model to look for whether there's any actual interstudy variance, um, because even though you can show that there is an effect here, when you do a random effects model, this might shift this way because you're accounting for uh, in-between study variance. Now, when you do a meta-analysis, you have your primary outcomes and your secondary outcomes. So this is an example of a table from one of my studies, which essentially talks about you know, I've looked at my primary outcome as uh, the you know, disease-free survival, one-year, three-year, and five-year survival in patients that are undergoing only palliative gastrectomy uh, or palliative gastrectomy and metastatic resection of liver mets for metastatic gastric cancer. Now, when you look at this, you can see here, what I've done is a subgroup analysis saying that although there is a treatment effect, <clears throat> for metastatic resection, it's only for those individuals that are either, you know, tumor staged between one, two, and three, or the distribution of the liver metastasis being either unilobar or multilobar. And these are, again, forest plots where you're saying, uh, you know, you run a, a subgroup analysis to make sure that these you know, effects, so you can say, oh, yes, palliative gastrectomy and metastatic resection does benefit uh, long-term survival, but only done 
for these particular individuals. And the, re the way I got these numbers is you, you subgroup saying there's six, there's six studies maybe that gives you information regarding the tumor stage. Uh, and those six studies also give you probably the, the information regarding the unilobar or multilobar metastasis. Now, when you do that, you know, you can say in your results section when you're describing that in, from six studies, I found that patients who fit these characteristics will benefit, you know, because you can't comment on either the, the tumor stage four and you can't really comment on multilobar metastasis. Now, after the forest plot, the other, the other thing is called, it's called a funnel plot. A funnel plot is, is used as a way to assess for a publication bias in a meta-analysis, right? And I will show you here what a funnel plot looks like. So when you look at this, th this here is called your 95% confidence interval, this arrow here. And whenever there, the studies fall on one side, say this, this side is favoring your intervention and this side is favoring your control, then if you have a lot of studies on one side, that means there isn't enough studies on the other side to really make a comparison, a true comparison. So the asymmetry is an indication of publication bias, meaning there's a lot of studies that only talk about one effect. Again, continuing your funnel plot, like I've said before, the, this is your 95% and these are your individual studies. And whether they fall on this side or this side, you should have essentially have a symmetrical measure. Otherwise, you can, you can say that there is a publication bias, uh, either in favor or in favor or in uh, not in favor. And these are the recommended resources that I would um, ask you guys to look at um, to understand such a meta-analysis further. And also, please go on the Cochrane Central Database to kind of uh, see what meta-analysis are because that's your primary go-to tool for meta-analyses. Thank you and please let me know any questions that you have. That was great. Thank you so much, Rahul. Um, I'm, I'm sure both our speakers have laid down, given us an idea of uh, an overview of systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, telling us all the guidelines that we're supposed to look for I think the one thing that we all find very difficult is where to really start. But now we know that there are these guidelines available. These are the, uh, you know, particular websites that we're supposed to look out for and the databases. They've also gone into uh, a bit more in detail about explaining about uh, funnel plots and how to go about the Prisma checklist. And I'm sure all of us have definitely benefited from this conversation. Thank you once again to both our speakers. Uh, before we get into the questions, I just want to remind everybody who's come in a bit later that we will need your name and your email ID in the chat option so that we can send you our feedback forms uh, through email and also for the purpose of certification. Sorry about that. Yeah, so we need your full name for the purpose of certification. So whoever hasn't done it or has must missed to do it earlier, please put in it, put, uh, it in now so that uh, you're not missed. And uh, we would really appreciate if you can give us a feedback um, on, you know, uh, how, how, uh, how it was in terms of accessing the session and about the quality of our presentations. All right. So let's dive in into um, a quick question answer session. Uh, please put in your questions into the chat box. Our speakers are more than happy to take any questions. Uh, one of the questions that had come in earlier was about uh, in terms of systematic review. Uh, if we're including only good papers, um, are we not really worried about bias? And won't this lead to only the desired outcome? So, so one of the speakers can choose to answer that. So yeah. when you're using good papers, um, you're using papers that have carried out the research well. So it wouldn't create bias if you have included papers that have carried out that research uh, without bias. So the whole point of choosing good papers is so that your conclusion is correct and not affected by bias or not affected by 
uh, including studies that were not carried out properly. So good papers does not necessarily mean favoring the outcome that you want. You're, you're choosing good papers in terms of fair conclusions and research carried out properly. That is what you mean by good papers. So, so to, that will not lead to any bias. So to add on to Dr. Day's uh, answer as well, it's not a, a question about choosing papers. It's a question about conducting a quality assessment of the, include, of the studies that have met your inclusion criteria. Once studies have, once, you know, say that there's 20 studies that have met your inclusion criteria, the next step is to do a quality assessment to see how well conducted a particular study is. You, you can ar argue that on a study that's not conducted very well, their estimate of treatment effect may not be of the true treatment effect. So preliminarily, you can do uh, uh, an analysis of all included studies. Then you can say, well, wait a minute. Now I have about, out the, of the 20, 15 studies are high quality studies. And as Dr. Day mentioned, you're not trying to say that I'm only choosing it, whether it favors uh, you know, uh, out the, the intervention or the control. So you can very well choose 15 good quality studies that essentially say that you know, the actual treatment is actually bad, right? So the, the quality assessment is unbiased way of saying these are well-conducted studies that have taken every, every step that's necessary to rule out bias within that study. So when you do the meta-analysis or systematic review, you're scoring the methodology as, uh, as uh, Dr. Anjali and Mr. Sobti have explained in the previous webinar to say, okay, they've, they're conducted well, so they probably have inherently less bias included within the study. And that's why whatever estimate effect that you get is actually maybe close to the true estimate effect. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Rahul. I'm sure that has answered our question. One of the other questions that's coming through is, can we form a hypothesis while doing a systematic review or meta-analysis? So when you do research, you should always form a hypothesis. A hypothesis is either you reject the, well, I mean, the, when you do research, it's based on the fact that you're rejecting your null hypothesis, meaning that if I were to say, uh, you know, smoke, my research question was smoking and lung cancer. When I do the research, I'm, I'm going to say that there is no association between, it's always the, 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 the double negative, right? And then when you actually find true, a true effect, then you've found it. So hypothesis is always, it's obviously the cornerstone of, of any research and is based on your PICO model. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that. Um, I think I just a couple of more last questions. Uh, what if my analysis of a trial is different to the published result? So I, I think usually I didn't, I didn't understand the question. So one of the other questions was, uh, what if my analysis of a trial is different to the published result, as in the findings that we have is different from what has already been known and published? Fine. So the, the, if it if it is um, the meta analysis part, say that you know you're looking, you're, you've taken, you've pulled about ten or fifteen studies. Um, and again, we'll go back to the aspirin and clopidogrel uh, for TIA model. And, you know, hypothetically, it, you know, there's the published results to say that, uh, you know, 10 papers or whatever, or, or five papers have, uh, of the 10 talk about aspirin being better, five talk about clopidogrel being better. And if you've done, if you've pulled the thing, that the reason you're pulling is to kind of give an answer to that, that debate. So it, your, your results need not align with the published results. You're saying that out of the 10 published papers, you're pulling the results to say, yes, this is better, or no, this is not better. I mean, at least that's what I understand from the question. Maybe that was not the intended answer or- No, no, uh, I mean, I, I think that makes sense. I mean, that's what I understood as well. Um, 
we've just got another question coming in which says um in terms of like you know studies talking about hydroxychloroquine and covid-19 you've got studies on both sides claiming that they are high quality randomized controlled trials some of them are saying that they are beneficial some of them are saying they are not so how do we really sift through that noise and understand which one to go for so the best way to go about that would be to very robotically analyze all the data that is present and do it in a very systematic statistical form pooling the data looking at it without any bias or preconceived notions and just doing your research in a very unbiased neutral format and then see what comes up when you have pooled all your results and analyzed uh, all that data so yeah. Yeah, absolutely absolutely correct yeah and also to add on i mean that's where the meta analyses come in right so uh, when you when you have about you know again the, it, it reverses back to the same thing and that's why meta analyses have have increased the number of publications in the last uh, decade being that you take those uh, you know the noise is you know some random uh, rcts are saying uh, yeah it, it, there is an effect and some rcts are saying there is no effect now if you if there is an actual if, if all studies are are similar studies in turn what what i mean by that is you have a population and some of them if the randomized control trial was hydroxychloroquine versus placebo for treatment of covid-19 and all 10 of them did that and five said yes five said no now you compare you pull the thing and then you get a higher statistical power and that was the result you get if there are comparable studies then that can give you an answer as to whether there is an actual um treatment effect with hydroxychloroquine for covid-19 yeah um there are a couple of other questions regarding ethics and statistics but i'd like to assure all of you that we we will be dealing with these sessions in detail uh with for uh, we've got dedicated sessions just for this the next one being statistics so we will be dealing with that in those sessions um i like to take a last question here uh, so based on systematic reviews and trials studied if we found a link say between smoking and diabetes could we note this down in the results without data really confirming it but completely based on our findings from these systematic reviews so you are supposed to uh, document whatever findings there are in a paper now if that data is not confirmed um i don't understand how would you say that there is a link between uh, smoking and diabetes let's say what you mean by that is that there is no statistical um uh, documentation in terms of numbers that you have found a link uh, necessarily but maybe you could put that in your qualitative analysis part of the systematic review saying qualitatively this is what uh, the link was um that i or we found between this and this and then whatever data qualitatively has made you come to that conclusion should be explained that this is the reason why we have found a link between smoking and diabetes it doesn't necessarily have to be in terms of numbers or statistics it can come to the qualitative part of your systematic review so and and yeah true and to add on i would say also say you don't have numbers then you can you can say that there might be a, yeah, a plausibility might of association but you can't say for sure that there is any you know actual estimate of effect because when you don't have any numbers to say you know smoking and diabetes now the other way to look at it is if you say you're conducting a meta analysis on, on smoking or something else and you have a, within the studies that you've selected there was enough information for you to extract data from the papers that uh, there was actually of the uh, of the 10 papers uh you know seven of them talked about uh we actually have uh you know diabetics who are you know uh, smokers and non-smokers and you pulled those as your subgroup analysis and if you were actually able to show an estimate effect then yeah surely you can comment on that 
But without doing that, to say that there is an association, you can't. You can, you can say, uh, I mean, because what, what is your association based on? I mean, there has to be a, a reasoning for why you're saying there is an association. And, and if you have qualitatively found a reason, then you must mention that as well, but say that this is not, this has not been proven statistically, and maybe it could be one of your limitations, or you could recommend that further studies need to be done, where we can statistically analyze this link uh, between smoking and uh, diabetes. So this could go into, uh, I, I can see that you, you've asked whether this would be a systematic review or a meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so this could go either way. It could be in your systematic review if you're just qualitatively analyzing something. Or it could also go in your meta-analysis in the qualitative section of your meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is an extension of a systematic review where you have added the quantitative statistical part of your study. So, but in that, you can also have tables where you have just discussed your qualitative data as well. So it could go in either way. So if you have a paper where this is a, a, a qualitative finding that you have found, but you also have other statistical data that you can put in a meta-analysis, then it would go there. But if you don't have statistical analysis at all, and you're just writing a qualitative paper, then in that case, it would just go on to a systematic review. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I think we've got that much for uh, only that for now. I'm um, really sorry about the fact that we're not going to go into detail in terms of the ethics and statistics, but I completely assure you that that will be taken care of in the rest of the sessions and that will probably make sure that you come back to us again. So our next session is on the 22nd of August and looking forward uh, to meeting all of you and more of you if possible. Uh, and you know, just sharing our knowledge and talking about things which seemed unfamiliar, but I think we're all getting into the familiar zone now. Thanks to all our wonderful speakers.